Good afternoon, space nerds. My name is John Conifay, and I will be the host of this fireside chat with the co-founders of Astronus, my former bosses. Um, I am very, very excited to, uh, to introduce you to John Gedmark, CEO of Astronus, uh, and Ryan McClinko, CTO of Astronus. Um, you've had, had a pretty exciting uh, 12 months here. I mean, um, uh, first of all, I, I have not been there, so you've not had that weighing you down. <laughs> and on top of it, I saw, I saw some pretty- We miss you, buddy. Oh, I'm, I miss you, and I, I think you know that, given how I was popping by the office before, but <laughs> before everything happened. Um, but uh, uh, I've seen some hardware uh, announcements recently, some testing um, that you're going into, so so that looks like really incredible progress that I'm that I'm excited to see. Um, but I don't want to give you give you each a chance to introduce yourself. Um, uh, John, if you want to, if you want to go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm John, the co-founder and CEO of Astronus. Uh, I guess I, I can just go through a little, you want 30 second, yeah. 30 second background if you like. Yeah. yeah. So my background's in aerospace engineering. Uh, originally got a couple degrees in that worked, um, as an aerospace engineer for a little while, uh, mainly at, um, a couple of the larger uh, aerospace primes, and then decided that uh, that I wanted to go and do something different. So I, I joined actually this organization called the XPRIZE Foundation. I uh, was there for a few years and worked on some, some pretty awesome stuff uh, and worked with Peter Diamandis to start an organization called the Commercial Space Flight Federation. So this is the industry group of all of the commercial space companies uh, and it's based out of Washington, D.C. So uh, working there with NASA and uh, the White House and the FAA uh, on all things related to commercial space. Um, and then a few years ago, decided that I wanted to go uh, go do my own thing and moved out uh, back out to Silicon Valley and linked back up with Ryan to start Astronus. So, yeah, and then excited to uh, talk more. And thanks for thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on. Um, yeah, well, <clears throat> what's what's your background? Yeah, Ryan, uh, founder CTO of Astronus, and my background did aerospace engineering also back in MIT. I leaned more on the mechanical side of things, did various more mechanical type work a little bit with ULA and, and SpaceX, and then after school went to Sierra Nevada Corporation, uh, worked on Dream Chaser, mechanical systems, flight control system for that, uh, both in terms of their test vehicle and then design for the what was going to be flight vehicle that is since highly pivoted, um, and then was looking to get something a little bit smaller, came out to, to Planet, and did a wide range of different things, initially came on various sort of generic spacecraft engineer, debugging various different things, power systems, stuff like that, uh, then switched over, became a lead of the electrical and mechanical teams, drove the production build uh, off to production, uh, and um, then, you know, Working on uh, sort of figuring out astronomy, and then uh, John and I went live with that. Very cool. Very very cool. Um, so uh, we are. This is the first new episode of a series that started, I think, about five five or six years ago, um, and is being um, uh, brought back to life called SEDS Talks. So students for the exploration and development of space, uh, which you two are very familiar with. Um, I think it's only fitting that the uh, two co-founders um, that either met in SEDS or what what was your uh, path to SEDS and then path to Astronus from, um, from SEDS or how does it relate? Yeah, uh, so I can go first um, and then Ryan, curious to hear your side of the story as always. Uh, so, I was involved in SEDS back uh, a very long time, <laughs> shockingly long time ago, uh, in the year 2000. <laughs> um, That's my poker which I think, <laughs> yeah, which I think is like in the, you know, that is like pre, that's like in prehistoric times. That's like before recorded history in, in 
uh, said more now. But uh, so I became the president of the. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Never mind. I don't need to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, no, it's giving. It's showing my age, obviously. So uh, I became the president of the Purdue chapter of SEDS, and tried to stay in touch with the organization and and with the leadership. And uh, actually, when I was at the X Prize Foundation, um, you know, again, so just staying in touch with the organization, uh, especially because there was a resurgence. Uh, there was a, a, a group of SEDS members, uh, Ryan among them, who made SEDS, I think, really what it is today with a, a broad national base, a national leadership team that coordinated across chapters and a, and, you know, uh, I think restarting the annual conference. And that was uh, restarted at MIT or one of the first couple of, of those uh, conferences was at MIT. So... Of course, uh, I flew there uh, as part of my, and I think I got X Prize to pay for it. Can't remember. Pretty sure I did, and uh, got Peter got Peter to pay for it. We jumped on a plane, and I mean, it was an amazing conference. It was just awesome to see all these students so passionate about space. Uh, and I met Ryan, who was helping run the chapter there, and we started um, uh, we started talking, and then uh, and then. Um, really started working together quite significantly uh, on uh, after uh, after a dear dear friend of ours um, passed away and, and we uh, started this endowment fund uh, to help fund since you know th through the ages that that was um, that was the goal and I think I think we've uh, I think we've made a huge amount of progress there so yeah right I, I don't I don't know if you wanted to uh, add some more color. Sure. Uh, yeah. So my my path towards SEDS was, I guess, I became generally pretty interested in space in high school, but didn't really have anything that, that I could do about it. And I was looking exclusively at aerospace engineering programs for undergrad um, and ended up at MIT. Uh, sort of the summer, maybe a month or so before before starting, I was looking at the different like club list and just saw the description for SEDS. It's like, oh, wow, that sounds perfect. Uh, I sent an email off to the like, about or whatever sets at mit.edu or whatever email address. Um, and and Daryl, uh, Daryl Kane, who, who John was referring to, uh, responded to that like within a couple days or something during that during the summer. Uh, I was like, I don't know, great and come join. I don't know, I actually don't remember what that was about, but I remember him responding to that pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, joining up with, with SEDS uh, I, did, I, did, I did a million different projects, but SEDS was sort of the central point of, of many of them. Uh, and at MIT, we also had SEDS be sort of the focal point of a whole bunch of those different organizations, which is sort of like a support organization that then sort of fed off all the other different things and did a whole bunch of other stuff like going to conferences and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah, I mean, Daryl had, Daryl and, and actually um, one person before him had, had sort of restarted that part at MIT Daryl hosted the first of the resurged uh, uh, space vision conferences in 2004. Uh, was the first one, and then um, the first one that I went to was then 2006, uh, and so that was at down at UCF. Uh, and I was convinced to run the next one uh, at a Denny's at UCF back before there were competitions now of uh, people wanting to host space visions, which is great. But um, no. Uh, back in, in those days, it was go in and convince somebody. And so it was, you know, convince the sophomore to to run the conference. Uh, and Daryl had hosted a couple of years beforehand. So I had some advice uh, and and yeah, and did that. And uh, yes, yeah, so I don't remember which space vision John and, you and I met on. I know it wasn't the one that I ran in, in 07 uh, because we did something endowment or whatever related. But then the year after 07 conference, we we announced the endowment fund, uh, which is, I remember there's some, there's some picture that I have in my mind that was like all of the initial uh, board of advisors or, or whatever that we called the thing at that point. I don't think we called it trustees at that time. Um, I think that came later, uh, but whatever that that group was and, uh, and, and John essentially Collected the the money for for that first chunk of of thirty k uh, going around like half of it was from the Musk Foundation and then from various other stuff and 
getting the sets founders to, to, you know, match each other and all that sort of other stuff from there. Um, and where the endowment fund came from was actually just like something when I was reading through like vice chair documents of just like, what's the vice chair supposed to do? Uh, and one of the things was this endowment fund that like Peter had tried to do a long time ago or something like that. And I talked with him about it and took it to, you know, kind of revive it. Um, so anyway, working on that, this thing that we continued going for a little while, when I was looking for my next thing from SNC, um, I, I, I mean, there weren't a million companies like there are now that are doing something spacey in our startups. It was basically like go to the Mojave uh, and work on something there. And there, I, there's no way I'm going to go live in the Mojave. Uh, more power to people who are going to do it, but that's that's not going to work for me. And so I reached out to a handful of different people uh, that I figured might have might have Excuse me. suggestions. And uh, and John was one of them. We had a long conversation in the SNC parking lot. Well, for me, I don't know where he was. Uh, and realized that we both had interest in in starting a, a space company. Uh, and so that conversation went. And I think I said like, I want your advice, and you said call me uh, instead of just like you know giving me a list of of companies. Or whatever. Uh, and so that went in a different direction, but that was good. Uh, and then we reconnected more after moving out here, and then. Uh, and then that turned into the like nights and weekends, uh, or I think it turned in first to the like few hours each Sunday, uh, turned into the, all the nights and weekends, uh, on top of the, you know, however many hours I was working at planet, uh, much more than 30. Uh, and then, yeah, eventually that got to the point where it's like, well, now we want to start like raising money and we need to have, you know, be doing it <laughs> as our full-time things if we're going to do that. And Otherwise, like we just need to, we need to transition. That is a more in-depth uh, uh, history of of Astronus's beginnings than I even had having worked there for the better part of two years. So thank you for that. <laughs> That's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, we got right down to some point. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, I think uh, Christian pulled don't, a bunch of that. Yeah, yeah, we need to get that thing together. Yeah. And by the way, the Seds Endowment Fund. I still think today is the only nonprofit that both Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos have donated <laughs> substantial amounts of money to. Like, there's almost nothing you could say that about in, in the world. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure the Seds of Down is the only one. So it's a pretty special yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, uh, and it's uh, it's still powering on, and, and they're working to open that up even more. Um, so we, we heard the the origin stories of Astronus, uh, from both of you. Uh, it's a really kind of fascinating uh, concept. We're, we're in the age of uh, communication constellations and communication satellites. We think people are slightly more familiarized than they maybe used to be um, as to why it's important, what's going on. But, but can you tell us what Astronus is, you know, why uh, you're building what you're building, as opposed to um, let's let's say larger infrastructure projects <laughs> are going for. Sure, um, yeah, I can I can take a first stab at it. Uh, so, first of all, I mean, I'm just speaking personally. I'm I'm a huge fan of anything new, innovative that is happening in space. Right? I mean, uh, I I'm just I'm a huge fan of it, um, and. Uh, I think where where we came in, uh, you know, I mean, we wanted to find something that could be a more of a step by step approach, um, whereas the large uh, low Earth orbit constellations really are something of a of an all or nothing proposition. I mean, you really have to do get this giant constellation up uh, in order to have some kind of a of a functioning service. So, um, you know, they have some real challenges, and and we have, I think done a good job of wiring, wiring ourselves up uh, to be really optimized for speed, being able to put up capacity uh, dedicated to a single spot right where it's needed um, and do that and do that quickly and get, get uh, you know, some of these small and medium sized countries uh, that are underserved today, a satellite that they can call their own. They just haven't been able to do that before. So that really is the model. I mean, in contrast to the traditional model of very large satellites in geostationary orbit that are that are really designed to cover an entire continent. Uh, this is an opportunity to put up, you know, essentially just 
focused beams of capacity right where it's needed and uh, really focus that down on a smaller, medium sized country or on a US state like Alaska, which is our first uh, our first customer. So um, yeah, it's just a very different approach. I uh, Honestly, I think that the world's demand for bandwidth is so massive that I we don't spend any time thinking about um, competition uh, in that way. It it's just it's more like we got to put as much stuff up in the sky as we possibly can as fast as we can if we're gonna have any hope of providing all the broadband capacity that people need today and, and in the future. So um, yeah, I mean I, I we are uh, we're pretty focused on our piece of it and and. Uh, and also a big fan of what the Leo constellations are doing. So, cool. So, so at its heart, uh, Astronauts is, is um, expanding broadband networks to countries or states that might not might not have it. Um, uh, That's right. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. And other other underserved areas like uh, like our friends Alaska and. Yeah. Um, uh, and doing that one satellite at a time. I mean, that's the magic of, of geostationary orbit is you can put up one satellite, get started with a pretty non-trivial amount of capacity to uh, the people that need it and really start to, to change people's lives pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, Ryan, I don't mean to catch you guard here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, what do you do? I didn't, no, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't fully understand um, it could be embarrassed to say this, but uh, <laughs> uh, how the internet was affected by geostationary satellites and how they actually functioned. Can you give us a pun intended, very, very high level view of uh, how that how that works and what an Astronus micro geo satellite does? Sure, so fundamentally uh, you refer to geostationary satellites, at least traditional ones as bent pipes. Essentially what that means is that you send a signal up and it gets bounced back down. Conceptually, it's basically that, is that you're taking internet from one location, moving it to another location, uh, which is not fundamentally different from having microwave repeaters terrestrially on the ground, um, or even something, you know, or, or how like Fiber. Monkey, brain, monkey brains, which is a, a local San Francisco internet thing, works as essentially terrestrial as well. And so, Really what you're doing is you're putting these, these repeaters really high in the sky. And the reason you put them really high at 35,000 kilometers is just that that's how they stay, you know, in the non-inertial reference frame of being on the earth, that they stay in the same place. Um, and so the effectively there is doing that. Uh, and traditionally those are even more truly a bent pipe in that you take a signal in, you mix the frequency down, you amplify it and you push it back out. Um, Whereas we're doing that, except that we're digitizing it first uh, and then pushing back out and amplifying it. Actually, there's amplification on both sides, but uh, of the digitization, but that's that's the detail. Um, and so fundamentally what that gets us though, is that if you're just doing the traditional thing, then you, all of it's the hardware, all of that's inherently inflexible. They're all hard filters, hard mixers, hard oscillators. Um, and so you can't actually change any of that from time to time. You have your map that's hyper optimized against whatever your service area is, whatever frequency plan you have, all of that. Um, whereas if we can use relatively uh, relatively wide range of all of the, the RF front end equipment, as we call it, and then can have a digital software defined radio, then we can be very flexible about all of that. Um, and so what that does for us is it allows us to not make every single spacecraft be a special little snowflake that's only good for one thing. I mean, sure, the traditional satellites are buses, uh, but they redesign the whole thing, at least all the payload is basically redesigning all the satellite every single time they do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we also can't quite make, you know, Ford Model Ts, but we can get somewhere in the middle uh, that allows us to be able to scale these things up and, and crank them out in a way that is faster, um, what faster, less expensive, more, uh, and, and yeah. Very cool. Okay. So standardization of the bus, uh, flexibility once it's on orbit, which generally larger satellites of its type don't, don't really, um, uh, provide and, um, lower cost of, of significant amounts of capacity that could, 
I don't know, triple the capacity that's available in Alaska or something along those lines, right? <laughs> yes, although I would actually say, I, I would not say standardization of the bus, I would say standardization of the spacecraft. Um, important thing about building the spacecraft the way that we're doing is it's an integrated system, not a bus and a payload, which is how the traditional guys look at it. Super important distinction, and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess you've, you've, you've gone through this, this entire process. You were, you were students doing, doing cool things, being chapter president, um, uh, and, and then leading space vision, one of the, one of the first and most successful space visions, uh, to this day. Um, and then you went into industry, got a significant amount of experience. Um, and and then decided to start your own company, and you've you've scaled from you know three to to ten to fifty to I think now over a hundred uh, employees at Astronus. There are quite a few actually watching. Shout out Sorry. to Jay Han and Brady, by the way. <laughs> um, but uh, um, but what? Um, what lessons have you learned at those different levels or those different uh, kind of scales of running the running the business that have been um, been most important to you? I guess let's let's say at at ten, fifty, and then a hundred. What are the major differences? <laughs> uh, man, we could be here all day. <laughs> Top uh, there's there's so much. Yeah, no, there's so much. I mean, uh, just you know, I, I'm sure you can imagine going from uh, five people working out of a, a garage, or in our case, a loft, a San Francisco loft apartment, uh, which is where we build our first satellite. Don't ever let anybody tell you can't build a, a satellite in your living room. Um, I've seen it. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's just, uh, it's, there's just such a massive difference from, you know, the, the, a small group where you're all, you know, you're all sitting in a one room where you can literally everyone can just like talk to everyone else, hear what everyone else is saying uh, at any at any time, right? Uh, anybody can just speak up and and uh, and talk to literally anyone else in the company um, who's you know no more than than three feet away from them. So going from that to over a hundred people, uh, you know, there's real challenges in trying to scale the the things about the company that that you care about, um, how you approach innovation, how you approach uh, people, you know, it, it's, uh, it's all about putting these systems in place and doing your best to try and, and sort of build into the DNA of the company, these things that you care about. Um, and it's really hard. I mean, because, uh, it, you know, uh, I, I suppose, I think it would be easy if you were growing that company to that size over the course of uh, 30 years, yeah. but if you, <laughs> but if you do it over the course of less than three years, uh, you know, I mean, just that, that kind of doubling time, it's really hard. And you, you end up with, you know, in, in fairness, uh, a fair amount of chaos and things, you know, things break and you try and you try and fix them the best you can and you, and you charge ahead. So, um, yeah, it's sort of doubly hard. I mean, space already is hard. Uh, <laughs> as we all know, yeah. and then startups doing startups, uh, to do space is sort of actually doubly is not even doing, it. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard squared. Um, uh, uh, it's definitely a startup on hard mode. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it really is about trying to, trying to figure out how you can, um, uh, put the right systems in place and, and, uh, and of course also find the right people, uh, which is the you know, the single biggest challenge, always, always, always uh, finding the right people. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I don't know, I, Ryan, why don't I uh, toss it over to you while I, while I give that some more, that gigantic question, uh, some more thought to see if I can uh, come up with anything else, yeah. Yeah, there's obviously a million, million different things there and I think there's probably a roughly on the order of a million books that have been written on this and uh, classes and whatever's. I would boil it all down to, I mean, John already sort of talked about this, but I would boil it down to the statement, communication is hard um, or slightly more cheeky, talking is hard, uh, which is that, I mean, 
in any organ in any any situation in in life, communication is hard. Um, and so, doing that in a way that the communication vectors and all of that need to now be different every six months um, because of the size of the company, how those people can interact, um, how just what stage, what you're doing, how you're doing it, um, processes need to change, and all that sort of stuff, and and navigating that in a way that um, can can keep maximum communication lines uh, is is super important. Um, and I think ultimately what what results in a whole bunch of things around what how well companies can work uh, plays massively into what um, how company culture plays out, how it scales. And, and all of that is, is a lot of it just comes down to, to how you communicate and, and building team and culture and, and structure and processes that, that allow for that. And, and that's really hard. Yeah, totally fair. Um, any more, any more thoughts before I, a, that was a good, a great segue into our next question. But if, if you, uh, if you have anything to add, John. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, one thing I will say that has that we have held constant through the different uh, different sizes is um, is how we view hiring the right people and uh, holding this uh, incredibly high uh, hiring bar that we that we decided to set out and uh, and sticking to it and. Um, of course, we got better at it later, and so we built this like, you know, essentially this machine to uh, recruit people and get them into an interview process and and bring them into the company. But we didn't have that machine in the beginning, and I think people would be shocked with how slow <laughs> our initial hiring was. I mean, it was uh, it it really is uh, it's sort of amazing to think back on it. Uh, and we had, I mean, we had investors and, and other people that were telling us that we were like, you know, I mean, we were losing our minds because we were, I think a year went by and we had hired like two people or something, three people. Uh, and they're like, what are you doing? Like, don't you have, a, you have a schedule, you have a schedule to meet, you know, uh, you guys are like sitting there waiting for like the perfect person for this role and for that role, uh, you know, because in aerospace, you have to have all these different uh disciplines that are, you know, widely varying. I mean, it, especially if you're doing something like, like we're doing. So, you know, mechanical, uh, GNC, uh, radio hardware, radio software, um, you know, we, uh, uh, the flight software for the, I mean, I can, the list just goes on and on. And they're like, you're just waiting for these like perfect people and they don't, you know, no such person exists. And I was like, no, they do exist. <laughs> I think we can find them. Uh, and we did. So, I mean, John, you know a lot of the, the early Absolutely. team at Astronus, uh, and they are still with us. And I am just so glad that we took the approach that we did because they are truly amazing. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, you, you really have to uh, stick to your guns on that one. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was very fortunate to be there about a little over a year and a half. And every single day, I was there. It was it was a new lesson and uh, a new download, which was absolutely phenomenal from from people I still consider to be um, absolutely top tier in the industry. I mean, it was one of the best uh, technical and other teams that I've I've ever worked on, uh, and absolutely feel fortunate to have uh, to have snuck through through. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say something like that. Not true, Conway. Not true. Um, uh yeah so so that kind of leads in how do how do students prepare themselves to become these top tier candidates these these uh you know there's kind of this this uh gap between experience and non experience <laughs> and how do how do students start to get the experience to gear them up to to be somebody that that you would hire and say yep that person uh you know that person has done this explicitly or or focused on this uh yeah what does it take what did what did you do if there's one skill um or set of skills that that students could hone or work on um what would they be uh i will i'll, I'll go first i think it's very simple 
Uh, they need to get experience working on hard things. Um, and so far on the engineering side, that means uh, building hardware, you know, find a way to get involved with some real hardware and a really substantial project. And, um, you know, a lot of schools today do a better job, certainly, than they did 20 years ago of getting, of making sure students have hands-on experience with hardware. But, um, you know, I would encourage people to really try and take it to the next level than what they might see in their classes, right? You get a class, a, a project in your class, it's semester long, you, you build something um, and uh, it, you know, you can learn a lot from that, but there's something to be said for a project that really takes, you know, a year or has to, you know, you really have to ship something that works. You're part of one of these hardware teams, uh, you're building something that's gonna uh, race, uh, you know, like the uh, FAA teams or uh, the rocket team um, and people, you know, it's just so important that people understand what it takes to do hard things. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know, Ryan, if you uh, wanna, uh, yeah, uh, add any more color to that. Been but. Pretty synced on that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't really have a whole lot to add there. Um, don't agree on all the things, but you agree on that one. Um, I mean, the, the thing- wait, 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 let's back up. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Uh, I guess a little bit to add there is just, I mean, doing hard things, people making, having to make hard decisions, having to do trade-offs, having, doing problems that are not just the cookie cutter little thing in the class that um, it, when you're in the class, it doesn't seem that way until you actually like, it's an internship, whether it's a side project, whether it's whatever, it's just like night and day, completely different. And that's, that's the biggest difference that sets apart an engineer that's two years out of school versus zero years out of school is that even the ones that did a bunch of internships you just have a different level of responsibility and you have a different level of what you're doing it all year uh when you're when you're full-time so anything that you can do to try to bootstrap that and try to emulate that as much as you possibly can projects internships fellowships whatever's um it's really a great way to be able to do that and you know classes and all that are, are important as well to give you the fundamentals to, to be able to know how to do that. But um, but ultimately the only way you learn any of the things is by practicing and doing them. So yeah. And, yeah. <clears throat> chicken and egg problem. So you don't have the experience to get the experience to start a project or you're, you're sitting there thinking, I don't know how to build a structure for a high altitude balloon uh, uh, payload or a, you know, build a, a the you know, you're a big fan of the the racing teams that are that are around as well. Uh, what does that look like? How do you how do you take that first step? How do you become engaged? I guess. In my experience, most of the I mean teams that I that I was on either that I was leading or that I joined or whatever, um, I found that that so many of the teams are just so open to bringing in new people, and if if you come in with a genuine interest and and wanting to learn and wanting to put in work uh, and do it, then uh, I mean, I was more than happy back when I was, was running these teams now a really long time ago, uh, back in school of just more than happy to teach people. And there's so many other people that were like that. That's how I learned all of my things, which is like people who come in, I had no idea what I was doing or talking about when I was a freshman or yeah. sophomore or junior, senior, later. Uh, but there's just like so many people that were that were more than happy to to teach, and then suddenly, six months later, you're doing the teaching, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you you took a, a, a kind of a different route to this. Uh, I mean, you had a pretty big day. Um, wow, I wish I could remember when uh, uh, Bob and Doug went up, but you had a pretty big day yourself <laughs> recently, uh, John, um, with with something that you worked on. Uh, from more of a policy standpoint, even even coming from an engineering background. Wanna, oh yeah, uh, no, no, I, I'm, yeah, no, no, I'm happy to, I'm happy to talk about that. I mean, what people don't realize, I think, is that this is the year <laughs> for commercial space. I mean, uh, it, I think people will look back, and anybody who's, you know, especially if you're just getting your start in the industry right now, um, you know, it, it just things were not always this way. It, it, is, uh, it is an incredibly fortunate time to be involved in the space industry. And 
if you think about it, I mean, in 2020, you have, uh, we just had this fantastic flight of Dragon up to the space station carrying two astronauts, first commercial service uh, provided to NASA of, of astronauts uh, uh, going to, the, you know, riding on a space taxi. Uh, we have Virgin Galactic that's flying people into space. Hopefully Blue Origin will fly some people into space. Uh, and of course you have just, you know, a massive array of things happening with small satellites, uh, new small launchers that are launching. Um, it is a, I mean, the variety and the amount of, of things that are happening is, is pretty crazy, but uh, it was not always that way. It, you know, back 15 years ago, um, 20 years ago before the X prize was, was, uh, was won and, and, um, before people sort of, you know, woke up to the, to the possibilities there, it was a different world. I mean, when NASA was trying to figure out how to replace the space shuttle, the assumption was they would replace it with another space shuttle thing type thing, like a, basically another big government program. That was the default, you know, and any idea to the contrary was, was pretty, crazy like you know it's like oh these like what these like startups really they're gonna do something for it like they're gonna fly people they're gonna fly nasa astronauts uh it, you know founded by especially if it's like you know spacex founded by some internet guy doesn't know anything about space you know give me a break um and then on top of that i mean spacex had uh some real challenges early on they had uh failures of the falcon one before that got flying successfully uh, and it was tough. I mean, people just, uh, it, it didn't even pass the laugh test when we first started working with NASA on the commercial crew program. So and who was this? Yeah. Who was we in this? Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it was, a, it was a whole group of companies uh, with the Commercial Space Flight Federation. You know, I mean, we, we tried to, uh, you know, run interference on, on a lot of it. And, and um, as the industry association, uh, um, play uh, as, as big a role as we could in that in that fight. And it was a fight. I mean, essentially what we were talking about was canceling some massive programs uh, that what um, uh, what was known as the Ares-1 program. So this, this rocket that was going to replace the space shuttle capability. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's billions of dollars of contracts to, to companies that are not shy about uh, about fighting for their for their contracts and, and not shy about their lobbying. You know, I mean, some of these big contractors, this is what they do. This is how, this is their entire business comes from the US government. So they know it better than literally anyone in the world. Um, and the idea that they were gonna let their contracts get canceled so that NASA could instead buy services from uh, a bunch of commercial space companies that had never flown anything before. You know, I mean, it just seemed like a, a crazy, uh, uh, just an absurdist thing. Um, thankfully, uh, you know, I mean, on our side was a new president was coming in, President Obama, who saw that there were there needed to be some kind of change. Uh, these programs were so massively over budget. I mean, they were over budget by more money than all the commercial space companies combined were saying like they needed to go and 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 do uh, and and do a lower cost option. Uh, <laughs> Like that's the amount they were over budget, not the not the total budget, just like the overages, and they kept piling up billions of on billions of of more overages every year. So uh, that was on our side. <laughs> uh, no, nobody likes seeing money wasted. So that was uh, that was a big deal, and um, and it gave us that window of opportunity to convince ultimately the president that he should give this new industry a shot, uh, and so he did. And and that's where commercial crew that just launched in uh, in the past few months uh, came from, essentially, right? That is correct, yes. That was initially proposed in one of the first budgets that, that uh, President Obama put out after he was a new president and just came into office. Um, he, he put forward a, a new budget for NASA that made a huge array of sweeping changes, including uh, a, a commercial crew program. Very cool. Very cool, and uh, I, I think it's it's pretty exciting for everybody watching and everybody on this call that they're they're on the space station now on uh, on a on a private um, private ride. Yeah, very cool stuff. Very cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, so getting back to Astronus and uh, and the cool 
technical things you do and opportunities for students to to get involved with technical projects and um, and this end to end uh, process of design build fly. Uh, um, you decided to donate a launch to SEDS USA uh, as as part of a way to give back. Or I, I think it was it was actually literally the first project that I worked on while I was there. <laughs> and yeah, it, 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 it uh, I was obviously thrilled coming, you know, coming pretty recently from SEDS um, uh, to help put something into space. So can you tell us what what uh, motivated that? What the impetus was for it, and how it how you got there? Yeah. Well, for sure. Um, and you know, the backstory is that. Uh, <laughs> so the backstory is that we did a uh, an initial test satellite, and uh, essentially, it, make a long story short, as a hedge, we ended up putting down deposits on multiple uh, rockets. Right, so we only, of course, launched that test satellite on one of the rockets and ended up flying on the Indian rocket and not flying uh, with space flight on uh, on a SpaceX mission. Uh, and that deposit, you know, essentially, I uh, or sorry, not space flight. My apologies, uh, Nanorex. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> so not flying with Nanorex on on a SpaceX mission. So I went. So you know, I was chatting with Nanorex one day, and I said. You know, hey, you guys have this deposit. I know the contract says it's non-refundable because that's how a lot of things are in the rocket business. But um, could we work together and see if we could find some something to put that money to use? Because like we could maybe apply it to a future Astronus launch. But uh, you know, I'd rather see if we could. You know, I, maybe we could donate it. And I mean, I think the motivation is that again to take it back to. Um, what we like to see in young people entering into the industry, we want to see people doing hard things. And there's no harder thing than putting something into space, building a satellite, and then actually getting it launched into space and getting it, you know, getting into space being a key part of it. Yeah. But uh, if you go out and talk to students right now, there's a real uh, lacking of launch opportunities. I mean, uh, there's been, I've seen a lot of, CubeSats and sort of these uh, small satellites, student-built satellites built that end up sitting on a shelf because it's just so hard to get the money together for uh, a ride to space. That's that's been the it's been that way for a while now, actually. So you know, hey, if that's the bottleneck, let's see if we can do something to help uh, and get uh, get a student uh, a student satellite launched and, and get them into space. You know, um, yeah. so that was it. Very cool. Um, have you have you had much uh, interaction with the team since I know we or you were at uh, Space Vision in at Arizona State when they made their first presentation, Ryan? Um, have you had much interaction with the team since? How's how's it seem to be going? Seems to be going well. Uh, I've been involved in their various design reviews and uh, been a lot of a lot of good work. Uh, hope, hope that my feedback has been has been received well, uh, but yeah, I've seen a lot of really good work out of it and I think they're making really good progress. Very cool. Hopefully we can figure out a way to get a said set three and, and other projects up as well. Uh, it's, it's the <laughs> idea of a, of, of a student led nonprofit having multiple satellites, uh, um, in orbit is just fascinating to me. And I really oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh no, 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 a absolutely. Uh, we, uh, we absolutely want to fund more stuff like that in the future. Yep. Um, and not just to support students, we need it for our business. We want, there's technologies we want to see flown into space that, I mean, you know, again, there's just not enough, uh, you have, you have a lot of new technologies that, um, you know, at some point they have to get, uh, space proven. I mean, it, it, it's just for a lot of these things, you have to do it, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, I mean, deployables, uh, you know, there's things where you just really can't test it properly without true zero gravity. Um, yeah. There's a lot of reasons. In fact, I mean, I, uh, I think when we went looking for flexible heat pipes, we couldn't find one that had actually flown in space. Uh, there's a lot that had been developed, but I don't know that we were able to find uh, ones from the from the vendors we talked to that, that had flown. So um, if somebody wants to fly some flexible heat pipes, uh, come talk to us. 
you put that you put that cool. on a you get a bunch of students to put that on a satellite so you can test that uh yeah maybe maybe we can talk yeah. um because we yeah we, we want to support things like that very cool very cool um i want to encourage everybody out there on facebook youtube uh twitter to uh comment ask questions um um we are more than happy to uh to go into into that section of this and and answer a few of those we have um one in from uh sprocket uh I mean, there is obviously top of mind right now is uh we're all in quarantine students are are being affected um, so Sprocket asks, uh, I'm a rising senior in the aerospace engineering program, and it looks like most of the school year is going to be online due to the pandemic. Uh, what would you recommend here? Um, how, how do students kind of get that on hands-on uh, experience, or what have you seen uh, students coming into your organization um, doing? Uh, yeah. Um. It's an interesting question. A couple of thoughts. Uh, you know, you can always do projects uh, by yourself. Not as fun. Um, and see, yeah, it's pretty pretty hard to pretty hard to charge through. Uh, yeah. You know, so hopefully this will will be. Um, you know, this will be a one time thing this school year, and then you know, into twenty twenty one, we'll start to have. Um, uh, we'll have to. We'll start to have things that allow us to return to normal. But um, I would say uh, spend some time learning to code, actually, uh, far beyond what, what you currently are. I mean, a, a lot of aerospace engineers learn uh, how to code or learn you know, uh, some aspect of it while they're in school. But there is a huge world out there uh, of software. I mean, obviously, it's you know, it a huge discipline. And um, over the years since school, I mean, I've learned to code far in excess of, of what anything I, I had learned in, air, in my aerospace degrees, and it has paid just absolutely massive uh, dividends. I mean, it, it, it's a skill well worth having. I mean, there's people that say, you know, part, it should be part of basic STEM education, that like every kid should learn, you know, mm -hmm. math and, and uh, math and science and then coding. And uh, along with, you know, it's like, uh, it should be a core part of every person's curriculum. But, um, yeah, that that is there's there are very real uh, hard things you can do with software that you can work you know online collaborative collaboratively with people on on open source projects and and uh, and do some really interesting stuff. So that might be a good sort of gap gap year uh, to do while you're if you can't you can't get your hands on some hardware. Um, yeah, uh, you you both been leading teams. Remotely, partially, uh, Ryan. What uh, what have been some kind of solutions or or things that you've come to find that have been super useful in, in being able to uh, move forward with the very um, real need to build a satellite uh, during this time? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> say to, to some extent, I don't know how much this is necessarily practical uh, in in the school settings. You know, during the the first part of the pandemic uh, and the lockdown that we had here in San Francisco, uh, we had a uh, move all the things to people's homes. Yeah. And um, that, that. Was, yeah. that was far more effective than, than you could imagine that it was. Yeah. Um, we were able to get into a state where, where, where we were able to move critical things back, in, back into the office. Um, but there was a period of time where we were operating like that. And it's obviously harder, but it's, it's better than, than nothing for sure. And uh, I would sort of imagine sort of tying this back into into you know, how can students be doing this? Obviously, the tools are going to be more limited. Uh, if you've got access to uh, to to machining hardware uh, stuff like that that you have in, in in your in your lab, you're probably not going to take a, a mill home with you. Yeah. Um, it's not going to work out. But uh, you can probably take some soldering irons home. You can probably take um, you can probably get, depending on, on budget allowance and stuff like that, maybe there's um, certain things that you can do of prototyping with like balsa instead of metal or, or things like that. And uh, and even in very early astronauts, I was doing some prototyping with balsa instead of 
uh, instead of metal for some of our very early like antenna prototypes at the very, very beginning, um, because it was something I could do in my apartment before we had an office or anything like that. And so there are ways that you can that you can do something not how you'd want to do, but it still allows you to design a thing and then somehow test your idea and then iterate. And ultimately that's what you're looking for in terms of this learning hard things. It's just finding some way that you can uh, you can design a thing, build a thing and text it. Um, and so, and especially you can also still be working with the rest of your team to do that. Um, and, you know, basic, basic amounts of, or mechanical things that you can do, basic electronics and things like that, um, getting some more Arduinos or, or, or things like that are also, you know, stuff that can fit onto even student project budgets. Uh, and you can get four of them instead of one of them and distribute that around and, and have multiple people working on that together. So there's things you can do. It's obviously more limited. It's going to be slower uh, and it's going to be harder, but there's still things that you can do. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, from one of the hosts uh, of, of Sedstock, we have uh, Arshir, um Systems versus aerospace versus mechanical. What is your take? This is the, I mean, this is every every question, isn't it? And uh, and it, um, I'm excited for this one. So, what do you, what what do you think with regard to specialization or, to a certain degree, non-specialization? Um, I'm not sure. I quite understand the question. Uh, is it what should a should someone go into as their chosen field of study. I mean that, you know, that's a say a yeah. based on their on their preferences and likes and dislikes. Um, I understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well Ryan, why did you take it? I mean yeah. I, I, I can offer I can offer my views. It. Uh, so like as, as as a person who is a, should I say, a systems-oriented type, uh, who likes to have his hands in, in all the different things, um, but also wants to just like do and make things, um, I've I've sort of dealt with this challenge throughout my schooling and then and then career of how do you do both of the things or how do you pick? And my answer was actually not to pick; it was just to do both. Um, and so. The question, I guess there's two questions because there's actually sort of like two axes that are rolled into, into one here, which is, um, so talk about the major side, um, the, the aerospace, mechanical, electrical, computer science. Um, I mean, ultimately look at what the classes are that you have, look at maybe jobs that, you're, look, that you want um, and, and what, they, what, um, what they're expecting look at people maybe that you know that are a few years ahead of you and see what they did. That said, uh, I will share a lesson learned that I have, which may not be applicable to all. Uh, I have two aerospace engineering degrees. Like I said, I leaned mechanical. Um, going aerospace engineering did me a disservice um, in that it gave me sort of the broad of all of the things. Uh, had I been uh, fluids, propulsion, um, something that was truly aerospace in terms of my leaning, uh, then that would have been the right major for me, um, given that I leaned on really something different. Uh, I, I would have been better off with one of those majors and still just like do all the same projects that I did in the aerospace department, which would not have been a problem. In fact, uh, we, we oftentimes preferred to find students of those majors in those projects. And so, uh, rather than being, but it was mostly aerospace students. Um, and so consideration that if you do lean towards one of those ways, you might want to choose one of those majors, but, but remember the projects that a department is associated with and the department don't have to be one-to-one. -one. You can mix that up however you like. Um, the other question that was asked here on terms of systems, um, which I assume you mean just sort of like I'm tying this out from the major side um, to be systems engineering versus, uh, you know, doing doing detailed mechanical work or electrical work or, or computer science or whatever. And I am I'm of the strong opinion that to be a good systems engineer, you need to first be an engineer of some other type um, that that gains you 
you can't be a good systems engineer. And I'll, I guess I'll you know make statements, whatever. Uh, people can disagree with me, but you can't be a good systems engineer if you do not know what it takes to to make things happen and to to do a thing, to design a thing. Doesn't matter what, in my opinion, you've done, designed, whatever. Uh, agnostic as to whether that's that's mechanical, electrical, computer science, other. Uh, but you need to know how to make one of those things because then you can do the systems engineering. You know what it takes to make the things happen. You can draw the analogs. There's fundamentally a lot of similarities between all the different disciplines and, and you can pick those out and use those to your advantage when you're doing systems engineering. Um, so you can definitely, you, you should, can and should, if you're interested in systems engineering, gain that experience of doing that also. Um, but but make sure that you dive into something as well. Great. Yep. I yes, I understand the question now, and <laughs> I agree with Ryan. What do you say? <laughs> Here, we Here we go. I think we only have uh, time for one more question, um, and I don't. I have a feeling that Daniel uh, Piemont is not a student, though I appreciate the question. Yeah. Not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice try. <laughs> uh, if uh, so, we have uh, Christopher um, Burt here, who has been a long time leader with SEDS. If mission requirements are largely defined by around the customer, how difficult was it as a new company? to confidently do design and prototype work before success. Wow, that is uh, a great question. That's a really great question. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, this is an area where uh, there's some general startup advice that is just, uh, it, it applies to all. I mean, it applies to aerospace as, as, as well as anything else. And that is to go out and talk to customers as early on as it is as you possibly can. So basically, from day one, go find customers to talk to, and you better, uh, you know, because especially in aerospace, by the time you're actually spending money building a thing, you better be damn sure that there's somebody who's willing to pay for it. And the only way you you do that is by uh, is by talking to to customers. And so it's just going to be a an iterative process um, where you know you're just like constantly getting feedback and. You know, the problem is it's hard to get in front of those customers when you almost have nothing to, to talk about. You know, you just have some like paper designs. If you're a company of two people, how much, you know, how much engineering could you really have done? How, you know, what kind of a, a satellite could you really be pitching? Um, hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but it's, well, as I was going to say, it turns That's out you can do a lot. <laughs> Just, you know, you can't, you can't, you can get, a, you can get, a, you can get a pretty good satellite design together and get that in front of customers and they will take you seriously. Um, you have to, you know, you have to not be dissuaded by that. So um, that is a, that's a very real thing. You know, you just have to get over that and, and go meet, go meet them, go meet them regardless. So uh, and take their feedback and take it to heart. I mean, you know, um, uh, so you got got to not be shy, and and you gotta you gotta iterate on it based on on what they say. Awesome, Ryan. What do you say? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very nice. Um, probably the most important question of the night: um, Who is your uh, favorite ex employee, and why is his name John Cotope? Go. <laughs> 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 oh man, you're welcome back anytime, kind of you know the, you know the uh, there's not much of uh, of tours going on at the moment as you can imagine uh, yeah. or visitors, but um, but hopefully that will change uh, in you know sometime in the uh, in the relatively near future. And I don't know, even if not, maybe we can sneak you in. There we go. <laughs> <Funny> suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll just put you in. We'll just put you in a hazmat suit. <laughs> um, thank Walk you, around. thank you to uh, both of you for for taking the time out of your very very busy busy schedules to uh, speak to the students and give back. Uh, very much appreciate your honest answers to the questions posed, and it's uh, great seeing you as well. 
Um, thank you to SEDS for hosting this and reviving SEDS talks. Uh, I hope everybody out there enjoyed. Um, and uh, there will be there will be many more of these, so stay tuned. Uh, thank you again. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.